What is up ladies and gentlemen, how are you guys doing today? Welcome to another exciting episode of Phenomenal Views, where you guys always know that the views are phenomenal, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, this is my continuation of me talking about my favorite DC animated movies, but also this is the time for Cinetober, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, it is going to be time for Cinetober Season 7, where we will be tackling, basically trying to avoid how to die. Uh, yeah, that's going to be really interesting, and uh, as far as I know, I'm not going to be attacked by Pennywise or Freddy Krueger. Think I'm in the clear. Oh, yeah. But, ladies and gentlemen, for now, I am going to be finishing my review for The Dark Knight Returns Part 2, which was directed by Jay Oliva, or Olivia. The continuation of Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns Part 1. I strongly recommend that you go back and you watch my Part 1 review, because that way, when you're in this one, you will not be confused, unless you've already watched the movie. And you're like, well, I already know what happened, so if so, then let's get this thing started. So, one thing I will say that I liked about how they did part one is because around the time when Batman is actually dealing with the mutant leader, they actually at the same time, around that time, have Joker actually coming out of his comatose state. And not only are they doing that, but they also are having Joker like, you know, talk with his doctor and stuff like that. And I kind of feel like if they had that in part one, if they had just ended it like around that time, I don't feel like it would have had the exact same flow structure. And I feel like it would have just made, basically made the movie feel like it just stopped out of nowhere. Whereas the way how they ended it, saving all the stuff that Joker does at the beginning of part two, for part two, I feel like it makes part one have a nice even flow and a very good film structure. So. The Dark Knight Returns Part 2, I feel like, does a really good job of finishing up the story from Michael Emerson. Now, I will say this, for those who don't know, he starred in James Wan's movie Saw, and he played Zep. He actually plays one of my favorite renditions of the Joker, because the way how he just delivers these lines and how he was portrayed, every time I see him or hear him talk, I just feel like this really disturbing feeling. I don't know what it is. Everybody leaves an impact on their roles as the Joker from Mark Hamill with the classic, uh, freaking Jack Nicholson with uh, Kevin, Co um, Michael Keaton, I think I've already said Michael Keaton, from Mark Hamill with his version of the Joker to Jack Nicholson's Joker to the guy who played him in Suicide Squad to Heath Ledger's rendition of the Joker. Every single different version of the Joker has an impact. But Michael Emerson's Joker, like, I just get, like, this really weird, uncomfortable feeling. And the way how he acted it, it really shows. He was able to deliver his lines and just make him feel like this is like a new version of the Joker. And they even say in the story he's worse than he ever was before with his lipstick and how he's able to use it to control people's minds. Now, uh, I will say that they also did another really good job of cutting out some of the dialogue or the monologues and either just cutting them completely or being able to be, being able to animate it very well to showing the character's facial expressions or their emotions that they're going through or they just save it for later to where it will be very important to the story and not just have it out there for no reason. Uh, it makes the film flow so much better and it doesn't feel like it's a collateral mess. So now I'm going to go ahead and get to the fact something that is very interesting is the whole fight with Batman and Superman. Now a lot of people don't know if you've not read the comic I strongly recommend that you go read that comic or watch this movie because the way how Batman and Superman are actually able to go toe to toe it makes a lot more sense in the comic verse how it did in Batman v Superman. Whereas in Batman v Superman, freaking Batman was just guessing. Whereas with this, not only did Batman know his weaknesses and how he works, but also it was because Clark was weakened from taking a freaking nuke to the face and a lightning bolt to the chest. Yeah, you're not going to be moving up as much after that. But they were actually able to... It makes a whole lot more sense on how Batman was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and bring him to his knees, or... Alfred is basically like, you know, you're not at your 100%. And Batman, who was played by Pete Weller, who I didn't even recognize who that was, Batman's played by freaking Robocop, ladies and gentlemen. I was like, oh my gosh, no wonder his voice sounds so familiar. I was like, where have I heard that before? It's Robocop! Huh? It's pretty awesome. Now, I will say, the whole dynamic with him and Superman in this movie, Pete Weller and Mark Valley do a really good job of being able to, they sell you so much on the fact that, okay, these two could have been these characters for years, and like you can just sense like this bitterness between the two characters. They played these characters so well, their rivalry together, 
and their dynamic of their relationship they did so well and it was and it was just very enjoyable how they did things this is a story that i really enjoy i have always loved stories of heroes coming back out of retirement and you know being able to come back and claim what is rightfully theirs i guess you could say now i will say another thing that they did cut they did have to tone down the violence quite a bit because in the story Joker actually does poison and kill a buttload of children at a carnival with cotton candy. There was a small hint to it when they go to Selena Kyle and Robin picks up cotton candy off of her foot, like in the comic, and she's like, cotton candy. They figure out the fair. Uh, a lot of people are going to be there, including a lot of Robin's friends. Now, they cut that out as far as I know, and th this probably would have had to been rated R if they kept that. Now, there is a scene earlier on where you do actually hear people at the carnival screaming in panic. Now, I don't know if that's just because Batman is coming down from the sky, or if there's children dying in the background. They really don't uh, explain. But I kind of feel like if they were to do that, it would have been rated R. Of course, so you do get you do see someone's head get freaking destroyed by a carnival ride, and blood goes everywhere. So, you know, there's that. But no matter what they had to cut, they also had a good reason for cutting it, I feel, and they were able still to make the film flow really nice together and not feel it empty. Now, one, another thing that they did actually cut, but they also kept, was the whole entire thing of the mutants still somewhat being a threat. And what I mean by that is in the comic, I can, like, you see other shots of them in their prison cell. And, like, you know, they're antagonizing the guards and stuff. And, like, you know, they eventually do break out of jail. But we still do get that big, epic fight between the city of Gotham and the mutants as the electromagnetic pulse happens. And this is where we get a, I would say, probably like a very main important part of the film. Where earlier on, you know, you had Wendell trying to, um, Commissioner Yindel, no, Yindel, who was trying to understand, you know, why was Jim Gordon keeping... Batman from getting arrested and he talked about how Batman was just too big and she's like I don't understand he said maybe one day you will and this is where she understands what he meant Batman's symbol and what he truly represents is so big it cannot be contained with being able to take people who are just out in chaos trying to murder each other bringing everybody together it is a really heartfelt scene and it is something very beautiful to witness and then, of course, you get the fight with Batman and Superman, which is done amazingly well. They did a good job, not only with the animation and the facial expressions, but with the sound design. Because whenever you see Batman or Superman just lay into each other, you hear the impact and you feel it. You feel like you're actually there watching these two titans just battle it out to the death. And it is a really epic fight. One of my favorite superhero fights of all time. It's just something that I truly enjoy watching and just feeling and hearing just bam, bam, bam. It's done magnificently well. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say give this movie a shot. Give the comic a read. I love this comic. I Like I said, I love stories of people coming back as their heroes and, you know, coming back to take back what is theirs. And also the whole entire point of this story, I feel, is it has always been our choice to decide what we're going to do. Are we going to just sit by and let crime take over or are we going to stand up and do something about it? And that's what this movie talks about. Someone standing up for what is right and doing what needs to be done, what sometimes people can't do. Guys, I'm going to give The Dark Knight Returns four batteries out of five. Only reason I'm not giving it a five out of five is because, well, I mean, actually, no, scratch that. This is my show. I can do whatever the heck I want. I'm going to give it five batteries out of five. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you have enjoyed my first rendition of me talking about my favorite animated DC movies. I will be doing another one soon, but it is time for Cinetober, ladies and gentlemen. And I cannot tell you how much I am excited to actually be able to do this again. I love Sanitober. <coughs> oh, man. My throat. Oh, man. I'm telling you, I cannot wait to tackle the other DC stories that I have. But, uh... Whew, I, uh... Guys, I kind of feel a little, uh... Whew. Yep. I'm going there.